Hey. Hi. Hi. I'm so happy to be chatting. I love, love, love your work. I've been following you for quite some time and really you are an inspiration. So I just want to dive in and start this conversation and hear what you Thank have you, to say. Rachel, I love the work you're doing too. I love your your flavor of using humor and just like very, very accessible, fun information that's very applicable. So thank you too. Of course, I feel like nutrition specifically gets to be a very confusing topic. Um, and there's so much, so much complexity to it. And unfortunately, little squares on Instagram just don't do it enough justice. So to share messages in their most simplest form uh, is a, sure. a bit of a necessity, right? That's the goal. So Melanie, why don't you give us an introduction about who you are, and maybe some highlights as well. I'm originally from Santa Cruz, California. It's where my family still is, a beautiful part of the country. I, I trained ballet there from really young. Um, and then I came to Houston to join the company here at Houston Ballet. And I've been here for 22 seasons um, and have a son who is now in college. <laughs> so I, yeah, I have a native Houstonian son. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've had a, a really, um, just a really fulfilling career here in the company, getting to dance so many dream roles and work with so many wonderful choreographers and coaches and um yeah we have we have access to just a lot of of talent in this field and so it's been quite a journey um in this in this ballet world <laughs> i i guess i will say something that i don't always get to speak to in my highlights or introductions is that for me i've always been a, an expressive physical person, a, a, a dancer, if you will, but I don't consider that just one form. I just, I'm a mover. <laughs> and um, my, I am the first person in my family who's a dancer. So I don't come from this like long held lineage of ballet. Um, my, my dad is an immigrant. Um, he's from Italy and um, he came here when he was 15 and both both sides of my family are musicians. And, um, and so I think that I hold a pretty like outsider perspective on a lot of ballet culture things that we just can easily digest. And that has given me like a nice balance to be honest, because I've, from the beginning, I've had a whole family behind me going, huh, what? <laughs> That is, that is an Italian family, and specifically around nutrition, since we're talking about that, they have been like, eat more, here's pasta, here's like literally, like they're like, what are you doing, you're too small, you know, so I've had this juxtaposition my entire life of like ballet world and then my outside life, and uh, I'm really grateful for that. So I think that's, I think that's where, as much as I'll say. <laughs> I love that. And actually, I cannot explain to you how much of that feels relatable for me because I too am the only dancer, dancer coming from out of my family with the exception of my mom who de to developed a liking towards dance later in her life. So she's always been like a adult fun. I'm going to yeah. go take some open classes here and there. <laughs> Um, but I come from a, a pretty large Jewish family and it's similar in the sense of when I experienced my own instances of struggling with nutrition and eating and food, I always had this whole other part of me, right? That was like, huh, what are you doing? <laughs> it's the holiday. Why aren't you eating this? You need to eat more. So I agree with you in the sense of, I think that played a huge role for my own self-identification when it came to something is not right right now. Like this is not what I think is supposed to be helping my dancing, right? At the time I thought that to, in order to be the best dancer, I had to stick to a clean, like restrictive, perfect little diet, which ended up burning me out. I luckily had that perspective, which is exactly what you're explaining, um, to say, no, this isn't right. Like if you're, 
what you're following, if you can't enjoy these other experiences of life, going out with your family, having these big, you know, holiday dinners and family dinners, then something is not adding up and something needs to change. So that's a perspective that I definitely can relate to you with. And it really kind of brings us into this conversation of balance, because one thing I want to talk with you about is throughout your years of dance and also motherhood, how has that shifted for you? How has your relationship with dance shifted just over the, I would say like the later professional yeah. years? So definitely for me, uh, a theme that has immediately been a shift from becoming a mother, almost from like <laughs> first months of, of becoming pregnant was a change in a relationship to my body. Um, you know, I think that I, I always had an understanding of these expectations and ideals and I could just visually see what was going on and the videos that I watched of, you know, ballerinas, I, I watched Kelsey Kirkland. I watched the video a thousand times that she ended up saying, disclaimer, I was very unhealthy. Don't take this as an example. And yet we were all taking it as an example secretly because we were absorbing that, or I was. Um, and so when I was pregnant with my son and my body had already gone through some pretty significant shifts, like as I had started my cycles and, you know, all of the things of becoming a woman from a girl. But then, of course, another big shift happened being pregnant. And, um, and the, the memory memory that I always hold that I don't even know if I've ever actually shared this out loud but I I actually remember doing this thing where I would take class and look in the mirror and I it makes me kind of sad now after the work that I've done I didn't want to see myself I didn't want to see my body like I had this weird shift going on on like um what's it called a conflict inside of me going on of feeling like I loved being pregnant with my son I had a really good experience and it was I very much wanted to be a mother even though I was a very young mother and um just feeling what was going on in my body was incredible it was it was amazing and I was like oh my gosh what is happening I'm, I'm growing a baby right now <laughs> um and so I loved all the changes but then when I would go into class and and see the mirror and see the other bodies around me I had all this conditioning and I literally couldn't didn't know what to do with it let's just say that and it was really striking mm -hmm. to me and it took me a long time to start like looking in the mirror again I did this thing where I'd kind of blur my eyes out and just try to dance and not see what was going on um sorry that was kind of a long way to to try to set the stage for the fact that after that I felt like I once I started looking in the mirror again I started looking in a different way and I started kind of being embodied in a different way and really just beginning to go through this journey of like being in my body as a woman and as a mother and trying to start to unpack all these expectations that now came at me much louder than they ever had before. Um, it was wild. Um, and so it's been, it's been quite a journey and I, I'm happy to say that I've come out much more appreciative of who I am as a body and all of that, what that encompasses and what, what food is for me and what dance is for me and movement. And it's taken a long time to like find a more sweet spot in that. Absolutely. Uh, so many really important keywords that you mentioned that I, I want to unpack for a bit. The first is this idea of us as dancers being conditioned in to believing that we need to strive for these unfortunate, most often unattainable and very unrealistic ideals, whether it is around our habits at mealtimes, whether it's around how our bodies look, right? And having this like one thing, these being conditioned, these thoughts, these external, both external, maybe sometimes internal messages that are coming at us at times louder than at other times. And then we've got this um, more inter internalized, intuitive feeling of like for you when you were pregnant, uh, just enjoying that experience, right? And having to really sift through all of those external messages. And that's 
what gets so challenging for dancers, especially our youngest dancers who don't necessarily yet have the knowledge to maybe know that those messages are unhelpful, right? I think for, for you, from what it sounds, you have to do a lot of work in reminding yourself that, okay, this is unhelpful, this is unsupportive, identifying those messages, right? And can you talk a little bit more about how that journey went in regards to maybe learning about or experiencing these, this, these messages aren't supporting me, these are unhelpful? Yeah, one thing that just popped into my head, the, the tail end of, of what you were saying is, well, two things. One is that when we're young and we're in anything, you know, we're in like our families that we come up in, we're in the ballet studio with teachers, we're so impressionable. We're like so moldable. And so of course that conditioning is really strong. And, um, and so I think we take things as truth, right? So it's like you have someone telling you or visually you're just seeing imagery that says, this is what a ballerina looks like and all, everyone looks the same. And we can talk about this in so many different ways, right? Diversity of many, many facets of being a human body um, in dance. But um, mm -hmm. the thing that really cued me in to start going, this doesn't work for me, um, was a loss of confidence, a loss of freedom and joy in the movement. I truly was, like I said, I always was a mover and I loved dance and I was pretty ferocious in the way that I would just throw myself and feel free in just about everything, even though I also relished the like precision and like all that hard work of like building classical ballet technique. There's that aspect too. Um, but I really started to see that side of my freedom of movement and attack really start getting smaller and leaving. And, um, and that was really scary because it felt like I was really losing myself as a dancer. So that cued me in that like something was wrong and, and I didn't understand why I didn't know how to dance anymore. That sounds extreme, but it kind of felt like that. Um, and I was really in my head and really worried about what people were thinking a lot. And people were thinking <laughs> things a lot as my body was shifting and changing. And so I, you know, to be really honest, I had to get outside help and, and opinions and I had to get feedback outside of the ballet studio to start balancing again, like, wait a second, these truths that I've digested for so long and at such a young impressionable age, and now I'm an adult in the studio, like, are they really true? So I guess maybe, you know, when you're younger, what I, what I always wonder is how do, how do we give these younger dancers the ability to critically think sooner? How can they hear this side of the the story sooner and when I'm in a room teaching or coaching or choreographing I'm very intentional to try to provide that but I can't be in the studio with every single dancer and so I think uh, I think that part of it is inviting young dancers into really thinking and and asking questions and getting curious about what feels good to them and what doesn't and um being able to ask ask questions, I think, is is a really big piece that could lead to. I'm not just going to digest everything that you're telling me as the, you know, the only way. I hope that made sense. <laughs> Part of the work, if not all of the work, I do as a dietitian for dancers, and within my program, I have a program called the Healthy Dancer, and it's all about redefining what we mean to be the healthy dancer. And I'm going to talk a little bit more with you about that soon. But what I want to say is one of the biggest realms of this and of the work I do is self-discovery. It's not some dancers will contact me and say, okay, well, I'm looking for a meal plan. I want to know exactly what to eat, X, Y, Z. And I'm like, actually, we're going to work together and we're going to start to build a body of evidence so that you can start to critically think and understand what foods, what movement patterns are feeling good for you, not just from a physical perspective, but also from a mental and emotional perspective as well. And that idea of exactly what you're saying, inviting younger dancers to start 
thinking, right? To start exploring uh, compassionately. That's another big one because we want them to be able to identify, for example, just as one, one example, signs of burnout. Signs of burnout can often be one of the uh, first ways that we can identify an inadequate meal plan, right? Just not eating enough throughout our day. I think a lot of dancers don't realize they, they come up towards like nutcracker season or even towards the end of summer intensive season and they're like drained, drained, right? And they feel even a sense, maybe even a sense of burnout coming on, not realizing that their nutritional intake, they might not have been eating enough to support increased uh, or higher, what am I trying to say, more rehearsals in their day, uh, more performance schedules in their day. So really understanding potential signs and burnout is just the first one that comes to me is an important tool for even some of our youngest dancers to take with them and start identifying, hey, oh, and another thing you said, getting those, those outside resources, right? Mental health professionals, dietitians, speaking with and accessing support is so incredibly encouraged yeah, for dancers. Sure. And I know that, that, I mean, that immediately makes me think about access, you know, and Thank, thank goodness we have these platforms now. Most people, whether they have access to outside support or not, can at least get on and, and find videos like yours and things like that. And so I think maybe the more that dancers that hold, you know, like if we're principal dancers, we have a responsibility to be speaking and sharing what we have learned with younger generations and pointing them in the direction of like, you, you know, for example, or like, or our other resources, because not everyone, just to be honest, not everyone can afford therapy. Not everyone, especially if you're a young dancer, not everyone has parents who perhaps have the resources themselves or are able to kind of orchestrate that. And so it's a vulnerable population. So this is a way, you know, online, you can find a lot of education and a lot of resource as well. So I think it's it's our job as dancers that are more experienced in the field to really be helping people to know that there are people who can help on here too. Absolutely. Accessibility is always something that I truly have valued, especially from the nutrition perspective, because so much of nutrition and food and unfortunately so much of what we what society kind of defines as being, being, and I quote, healthy is not accessible to most of the world, right? So, so providing uh, these conversations, providing my, my blog, dancenutrition.com was always an outlet for me to help with increase in accessi yeah. accessibility on these topics. And I do want to ask you because I think it's a it's a big question and before we sign off I definitely want to get your insights on it but I would love to hear from you in regard to how you would redefine what it means to be the healthy dancer because so often dancers hear healthy dancer and they immediately think more work in the studio more and I quote healthy food choices but that's not necessarily everything and I from what we gathered in this conversation it sounds like you have built so much experience in your life that feeds into how you would redefine this. So I'd love to hear from you. Um, I would define a healthy dancer as someone who honors themselves. And um, I think that there has to truly be spoken about a balance between self-respect and, and compassion for self as like the first stop in this field um, and then of course integrating and digesting the outside feedback that is coming in but I think that we have to truly cultivate and this is in all areas right so this is this is what we eat this is how we rest this is how hard we push ourselves and when to say no and when to say this this is hurting me or this feels uncomfortable to me or there has to be a very strong sense of, what am I trying to say, um, loyalty 
to who we are first. And I, and I think that it's pretty opposite um, in a lot of dance training, you know, it's like the trust gets flipped. So what I think of as a healthy dancer now for myself, I, I try to endeavor to cultivate practices within myself that build trust and good relationship with my instincts, my intuition, what feels feels good to me in 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 my life and then I take that into the studio into the ballets that I'm dancing into the work relationships that I have but if I don't have a genuine healthy relationship with myself I can't have a healthy relationship with with ballet and with dance. and so just cultivating that like self-love and and knowing like really honoring who you are I think I know that can sound so broad, but I, I really do believe that if that's like first and foremost, all of this stuff becomes clearer. Absolutely. Uh, building self trust, utilizing discovery, as I mentioned earlier. One word I always like to provide also is the word of nourishment. Oftentimes we think of nourishment again as only looking at our food choices, but dancers should understand that nourishing our bodies really means just as you mentioned, looking at this from so many different perspectives. Are we providing ourselves with enough time to rest and recover? Are we thinking of fueling our body like consistently and regularly throughout the day because for so many dancers long rehearsals long performances it can be easy to even let snack habits and mealtime habits fall to the waistline not get enough in and then experience a lot of appetite dysregulation so it all really comes to play also just experiencing Obviously, I experience this myself as well, but motherhood helps us in experiencing so much more in our life that's just outside the studio that we can ultimately bring back into the studio. Ballet in particular as a dance form really leans towards perfectionism and like a rigidity in like, this is the way, this is the way you've got to look, this is the way you've got to dance, this is the way you've got to show up, this is, you know, it's very extreme. And um, I think, that like you mentioned this kind of shift into motherhood like really shows you that stuff's not perfect <laughs> but if dancers can rework yeah. a little bit from the beginning just noticing who they are as a dancer and when it digresses from that perfect you know train and and that can lead to shame or self-criticism instead of that I think that there needs to be curiosity and compassion around like, oh, so I'm not like that mold, but that doesn't make you less of a good dancer or a good ballerina. It gives you your own identity and that's beautiful. That's diversity, right? And so celebrating that and honoring that mm -hmm. instead of a dancer getting so down on themselves because they're not reaching this perfect mark is another important part of this conversation. And I think really belongs, making mistakes, great. It means that you're showing up and trying. <laughs> so I, yeah, I think that that's, that's just another piece that I would say is, yeah, get curious around that perfectionism and like when you don't make that mark, it's not failure. Absolutely. Melody, you are a wealth of knowledge and insight um, and such an inspiration really to all of us. So I just want to thank you so much again for joining me in this conversation. It's such a pleasure to connect thank with you, you and I look so forward to connecting more.